Well, so if you want to build great wealth, wealth that is above the average out there in your country, in your city, you need to have that offensive mindset. So spending is offense, saving is defense. You can only save so much to build wealth. It really is just a limit, but the income side is unlimited. Welcome everybody to the Selling With Love podcast. This is your host, Jason Mark Campbell. So excited to be having a conversation today, which is gonna be outside of our regular sales talks, but really getting us prepared and having an understanding of what's happening in the world right now with talks that are happening around recession, thinking about market changes, inflation. So I wanna bring a conversation with someone that has been speaking about finances for decades and is gonna come here to share us more about what are big actions that we should be doing as we're investing in ourselves, maybe looking at making changes in our lives. Maybe as we build the business, there's some fundamentals and finances that we would want to make sure are in place so we can navigate if it is a coming storm. And if so, we can find ourselves thriving in the process. I have Sam Dogan with me, who is the founder of Financial Samurai that's been operating since 2009. He has been helping people really get full education when it comes to finances. He has just released his book, Buy This, Not That, How to Spend Your Way, that's right, Spend Your Way to Wealth and Freedom, who has just hit the Wall Street Journal list on bestseller and has been doing education. This blog has over 90 million readers, has been featured in major publications like the Wall Street Journal, Sydney Herald, Chicago Tribune, and LA Time, and he compl- always being very transparent on his own finances, keep sharing people how to build your own net worth through various things that we're going to be discussing about just today. Sam, welcome to the show. Hey, Jason. Thanks for having me. Now, I love that I got introduced to you. And it was through a mutual friend, uh, Noah Kagan, who's been a guest on the show before, was talking about how a lot of people are having these fears around recession, market condition, things are changing. So I kind of want to get into that elephant in the room conversation right now, which is with everything that we're seeing around, you know, uncertainty, lack of confidence, some things economically that are happening, what are some of the biggest things that we should keep our antennas on as we are operating a small business and we want to make sure that we're not being thrown sideways with what's about to come. Yeah, well, I'm a small business owner myself, technically since 2009. And I think the recession is here in at least the United States with first quarter and second quarter GDP down. The Fed is going to continue to hike rates. They've been very clear about that. So I think there is probably a 70, 80 percent chance things are going to get worse. Um, So what you want to do is look at the past and the past shows that the average bear market so when the stock market goes down over 20%, you know, which includes the recession, uh, generally lasts about 12 months. And so if you can survive that 12-month period, things should be better. Because during the 12-month period, if you can survive, get your cash flow down right, your competitors are actually, who don't do that right, are going to fall by the wayside. They're going to lose market share. They're going to go out of business. So in actuality, the recession can very help. It can help your business thrive because you could be the last one standing. So you have to have that type of mentality. And if you think in that type of mentality, okay, just get through 12 months. We're probably six or seven months in right now. So it's it's only five or six months left, in my opinion, based on also historical averages. If you can get through that, get into 2023 and have your balance sheet in good shape, I think you're going to come out pretty well. Well, Sam, one of the things I love about your book is the first thing you actually start talking about is the mindset piece when it comes to money management and business operation. And I find that, you know, for most of us, we hear news that are negative and obviously the media does its own job at amplifying this very extremely. And so I'd love to see what are some of the healthy mindset exercise you would recommend people to do so we don't get carried into this craziness and we can start being a bit more rational, realizing, hey, maybe it's just making a plan for the next year. Yeah, I mean, you think you can you can look at a recession and the downturn in various stock markets and say, oh, that stinks for my net worth. Things are going down. You know, life sucks. Or you can say, well, look, a recession is a great time to recalibrate your business model, boost your balance sheet, increase your margins, find new customers, look for new products and strategies to sell. And that's the mindset you have to have. Um, because I, there's literally trillions of dollars out there in the world for the taking. People who, you know, maybe not are as smart, not as smart as you, are doing very well. And why is that? Well, maybe they are 
being more strategic. Maybe they're hustling harder. Maybe they're creating new partnerships during the downturn. If you look at a lot of the companies that have been found that are successful today, they were founded during the previous global financial crisis. So Uber, Airbnb are two of the most famous ones. A time of struggle to really innovate. And I think uh, it's going to be very exciting. You just have to have that patience to keep on going. For Financial Samurai, um, it's been around since 2009. I just write articles. I, I made a promise to write three articles a week for 10 years in a row. And hopefully something good would happen. And that's what I did. And I enjoyed it. And I became better at it. And amazing things happen when you're not paying attention and that you cannot connect the dots. But sooner or later, something good is going to happen. You just have to survive. You, you mentioned something interesting um, around this mindset, which is actually a bit of a longevity type of mindset that I seem you've had, even when starting your small business here with Financial Samurai, you made a 10 year plan and you had a very clear, consistent action about delivering value or creating content here. And I find a lot of times, especially in the early times of businesses, you're trying to maybe just get a cash flow bump. Uh, you're trying to make a couple sales so you can actually start replacing your, your income. I'd be curious to know in your case, was it that the moment you switched to Financial Samurai, that was your only source of income? Or how did you justify making that promise, building a plan over such a long time and not yeah. being needy necessarily on cash flow demands from that business? Well, I think the best way to start a small business is to do it on the side while you have a steady day job. I started Financial Samurai in 2009 while I was working in finance. So I'd work on it you know, at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., and then I'd work on it after 9 p.m., and after about two and a half years, I realized there was something I could retire to, and that is Financial Samurai. Because I was I remember I was in Santorini, Greece one day, and I had been hiking up the crater. It was 78 degrees, 2011. And this guy just emailed me and said, hey, I'd love to advertise in Financial Samurai. I'll pay you $1,000 to put a link up, a banner up on your homepage. How about it? And I was like, hmm, sounds pretty good because I was, you know, having an eight euro Mythos beer and just chilling out. So I, this is Wi-Fi, you know, my iPhone, this is pretty novel back then. And I was like, okay, let me do it. And I put it up in about 15 minutes. I figured it out. And then he wired me a thousand bucks in 15 minutes. And I was like, wow, that was pretty easy. Let me order another beer. And so I realized that, wow, if you can build consistency and a brand over time, that becomes very, very valuable to readers and to advertisers. And so that's what I did. I found my own unique style. I was reliable because, you know, reliability is huge in terms of the content uh, business, as you would call it, because people want to subscribe and be vested in someone who's going to keep showing up, keep sharing his or her stories and keep sharing his thoughts about the economy, investing and so forth. Yeah, I find again, this is amazing because you were two and a half years into it before that event happened. And so there's a question of longevity, even in the way of operating your business as a side hustle before recognizing that this is an income stream that you can really nurture. And this is something I've noticed a lot in the industry is there's a lot of pressures or at least a lot of businesses that are advertising for people to make career changes and telling, you know, you can stop everything, you can have instant success and make a ton of money really quick. And that seems to be the marketing message that gets sent to a lot of listeners I see when there seems to be a realization or a sobering up that happens during more recessionary times, which is, hey, things are going to get time, they're going to take time. And you're going to need to actually have another stream of income before this gig ends up being something that continuously pays you, especially if you haven't developed the skills before that time. Now, in your case, you worked in the industry that supported this development of this side gig. How important was it for you to be building those skill sets in the job that you had that allowed you to be even more competent in the way that you were starting this side hustle? Well, the funny thing is, um, I asked my employer whether I could start, uh, you know, a personal finance website. They said no. And so I decided to do it anyway, because my freedom of speech, this is my own personal journal, and I'm gonna do it outside office hours. Right. And so in terms of experience, I felt I needed 10 years of experience. I graduated college in 1999. So I started Financial Samurai in 2009. And I don't know if I needed 10 years of experience to be able to write logically and, and with authority about personal finance and finance in general. Uh, because certainly that at that time, I didn't know anybody with finance backgrounds who had that experience. Um, and it's the same thing with my book, By This Not That. 
when I published it in 2022, there's still not too many authors with personal finance or finance experience writing about personal finance. So I, I decided, oh, let me just fill that hole. Um, in terms of taking that leap of faith, so I had huge plans, uh, really strategic plans, I mean. So one, I planned to uh, have a severance. So I negotiated a severance in 2012 that actually paid for five years of living expenses. Uh, just normal living expenses, not extravagant and not like, you know, really, you know, beggar like living expenses. But I knew that if I could, if I could negotiate a severance, there was no reason why I shouldn't take a leap of faith because I had a five year runway. And then two, I built a passive income from my investments. I had invested in real estate and dividend stocks and bonds and CDs develop enough passive income so that I wouldn't starve. And that amount was about $80,000. And then finally, I had been starting to generate some income from Financial Samurai. It wasn't huge. It was like one, $2,000 a month pretty regularly. And I knew that all I wanted was a correlation with effort and reward. So I had to make a bet with myself because I was leaving a well-paying job in finance. Would If I tried harder in on Financial Samurai, would I be rewarded? And the answer has been absolutely yes. That's all we really want is, I think, entrepreneurs, correlation with effort and reward. I find it interesting in your, in your book, you have the subtitle that talks about how you can spend your way to wealth and freedom. And I think in most of our minds, especially in a contracting economy, save, save, save is the mantra that gets repeated. So I'd be curious to know, was that a headline written for attention or is there some, what's the, the wisdom around having to pay <laughs> to get the freedom here? <laughs> well, so if you want to build great wealth, wealth that is above the average out there in your country, in your city, you need to have that offensive mindset. So spending is offense, saving is defense. You can only save so much to build wealth. It really is just a limit, but the income side is unlimited. So spending is about a choice about how you spend your time and how you spend your effort, energy, money, stress, and so forth. So. I want this book to help people make those optimal income building decisions so you can grow your wealth greater than the average person. Because the average person, really, they understand how to save, they understand how to budget. These are default settings that everybody should have. You shouldn't even, after about a year, after you know your budget, like the back of your hand, you shouldn't really even be paying attention to how much you're saving and saving because it's just automatic. You know you're saving 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, whatever it is, and you're reinvesting that into risk assets that will you, hopefully bring, bring you greater returns in the future. What you should be spending your time on is really building your business, building those side income streams, build, working on that side hustle while you have a day job, You know, building the bigger network of clientele, spending time on your brand. That's a really key mindset shift that I want people to focus on. Because if you look at the, here, at least in the United States, the average, you know, the median net worth is like 10 grand, 15 grand. And the median age in America is like 35, right? So that's not really going to cut it uh, in terms of living a nice retirement lifestyle or the lifestyle of your dreams. I love when it's a uh, recession time. As you mentioned, most people go on the defensive, but I, I've noticed that the trends of history is that whenever everybody goes on defense, the one that actually chooses to go against the grain on offense actually gets to acquire more customers for cheaper because yes. nobody else is spending on acquisition. They're all yes. cutting costs. And so marketing budgets become more effective. You just need to be bold enough to be able to make that decision. And I guess you have to have had a plan or at least be in a cash flow rich position so that you can make these kinds of offensives. Now you've already given the model at least have 12 months of operating. So then you can actually use anything above that to be a bit more aggressive during the recessionary times because it will yield even better benefits. But what would be one of the best things you would suggest people to invest in if they're just at the early stages of starting their side hustle or business? Well, invest in in terms of like risk assets, risk, risk assets like real estate stocks or their business. <laughs> to be honest, actually, I'm kind of feeding you one because I notice in your book, you talk a lot about investing in education. And I wanted to know what kind <laughs> of education would be the most fruitful here, because I know that's a big part of the book. Well, yeah, I do believe education will set you free. Uh, I remember graduating from college and thinking to myself, I'm never going to go back to college. This was just like a waste of time. This is back in 1999. And then I ended up going back to business school part time uh, for my MBA at Berkeley, because I was also afraid of getting let go. 
Uh, right now, the thing is, education is free now. Whether it's listening to podcasts, reading affordable books, you know, going online to check out courses by famous colleges. Spend that time educating yourself about your business, about the things that you know you want to do, and about investing and financial planning. It, you know, look, I think many of us small business owners, we start our businesses because we want to be our own bosses and we want to be free. Now, it's just one engine of our wealth equation. It could be a very large percentage of our net worth, but I think you need to be strategic in building those money soldiers. The money soldiers include investing in, you know, the S like dividend stocks, S&P 500, a real estate portfolio that can generate some passive income so that with one money engine down, let's say let's say your small business money engine is fading right now. It's down 30%. You know, that's just the way it is, right? Advertising revenue is down. It's very cyclical. You have other money and money engines that can lift you up in terms of your dividend stocks, your real estate portfolio, and your consulting abilities. So you want to build as broad base of um, you know money soldiers as possible so that you're always protected. And that's just been my mindset because I just never want to go back to having a day job again. You know, I have two young children. They're only going to be in the household for at most probably 18 years. And I just want to maximize that time with them. I love that. Now, as someone who used to be in real estate, still does it a bit on the side, uh, I do have an appreciation for that asset class. And you're talking about taking a lot of that money that you have and putting it into various, you know, units, soldiers that are going to be generating revenue. But there must be a point where you actually start doing these things. So my question here is like, if I'm struggling, I'm building my business, maybe I'm sitting on like an annual income of maybe like 40,000 and mm -hmm. I barely make enough. Yeah. And all I want to do is reinvest it in my core business. Yeah. Is there a number or is there mm. a, a point where you start thinking, all right, I shouldn't invest more in my business. I should be going and putting up new assets that are going to counterweight the risk of this business. Is it a number or is it a certain term? How do you, how do you gauge that? Man, that, that's really a difficult, difficult question because what I've done um, since 2009 is I have not invested so much in my business. It's interesting. I haven't reinvested much in my business. I've used that cash flow to reinvest in real estate and things that will be stable if in case my business airplane goes down. And so... You know, if you let's say forty thousand, how much should you reinvest in your business? Well, I would say strategically, though, you know, over the next six months, um, remember the number one goal is survival through a recession, and it could get worse. So, I would be a little bit more hesitant in spending too much. You, you want to have that good balance sheet. You want to have enough cash to, to survive that six months. So, I guess that would be that would be my 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 first recommendation. Do you have that? Do you have that six to 12 month runway where you're good no matter what? Anything above that, then you can focus on the offensive in terms of trying to get market share, acquire customers for cheaper, advertising rates are, are lower. That's your time. But if you don't have at least a six month runway, then I would be working on building that. I also love that you have a chapter that talks about nurturing your love. You're also on the <laughs> Selling with Love podcast. Can you unpack that for us? And is that something that takes more time or what are we talking about here? I'm talking about uh, love with your friends and you with your family and your significant other. I mean, I've. it doesn't really matter how much money you have, how successful your business is, if you don't have anybody to share it with. I, I really strongly believe that. You know, at the end of the day, you want to share your wins with your best friend or with your significant other, because that is just true wealth, in my opinion. It's it's just, and, and, and the thing is, is we spend so much time, you know, strategically thinking about how to make money, growing our business, and all that. But do we spend enough time working on our communication skills with our significant others, you know, showing that we care about them, taking them on date nights? That, I think, is, is just a huge misalignment of uh, how we spend our time, because the people we love are the ones who are going to make us the happiest. 
I love that. And I do agree. Date nights need to be scheduled. That's something <laughs> we always do. And we always have a fun moment. Me and my partner, it's like, okay, I, I look at the week and I'm like, hey, date night's coming up. And it always brings a smile, right? So I think these are little investments of joy that I also agree with. And, um, you know, as we're coming to a close, I just want to ask, how does a fast financial samurai live? Is there a style of living that you recommend? Because samurais had a very unique way of living back in Japan. I wanted to know, <laughs> what does a modern samurai in finance life look like? Well, I would say, first of all, you got to be humble. You got to be humble because we have the power. We have the power to affect positive change. We will be able to build more wealth over time than the average person. Whether you read the book, whether you just get involved in personal finance, it's just a very infectious idea where if you're hanging around with other people who want to build wealth, um, you are likely going to build way more wealth than the average person who just wings it. The good thing about being uh, a writer for the past 12, 13 years is that you've, I've grown up with people, you know, 10, 13 years later, they're like, oh, I was able to buy a house. I was able to send my children to school and do these great things in life. And some people just say, you know what, man, I uh, just winged it with my finances. And five to 10 years later, I'm wondering, well, where did all my money go? And so I think a financial samurai is really going to be able to outperform and not only with wealth, but by giving back. And I think a core tenet is to be humble and to create a perpetual giving machine. That's another thing. It's like the more you give, the more you get back. And the more you give, the better you feel. It's pretty unbelievable how it works that way. And so one of the ways to do that is with your time. And the other way is to do that with your money. And if you can combine that, I, mean, I think that's it's just a really wonderful feeling. So if you're lucky enough um, to achieve greater wealth than average, look to give back. At least a portion of that, uh, I think, is going to come back in spades. Sam, this was a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. Big things I took away from this for anybody else listening for me was looking at having that safety net, looking at covering yourself 12 months whenever a recession comes. And I'm glad we only touched a little bit on the recession because yes, it's a bump in the road. The economy is still happening. And just talking about 12 months is not like looking at doomsday scenario, which oftentimes if you commit, you start listening to the media, that's the feeling that seems to be communicated. So let's ground ourselves, make sure you have that runway. And that's a good financial basis to start with. We talked about how you can actually have working soldiers for you. And I started thinking, yeah, it's actually a good idea to make sure that I refocus on things that I have passions about for myself. Real estate is a big one of them. The stock market in America, not as accessible as a foreigner, but I know that there's some really interesting vehicles that I like to use, such as real estate. So I want to make sure I have that as well. And I love that you've reinforced as well that don't quit your J job on a notice. Know that especially during these times another stream of income as your primary from your career is going to be very important and give you the advantage as you go and start a side hustle. It's going to take some time and that's okay. Start thinking long-term. I love that you had a 10 year plan of commitment to be able to create value and see where it takes you. And now financial samurai, biggest blog in finance, amazing amount of readership, fantastic book just came out as well, all as part of your journey with a long-term goal. So keep that in mind. And Sam, one more thing I love to ask everyone who comes on the show you are on the Selling with Love podcast. What would you say selling with love means to you? Oh, selling with love means being true to who you are. That's the one thing that um, is one of the huge benefits of financial independence is you no longer have to kowtow to someone that you don't respect or believe in. You no longer have to hold in your truth if you are offended or someone does something wrong to you. Selling with love is uh, selling because you're true to yourself and your beliefs. So wherever you go, whatever you do, that's the best thing about financial independence. It's because you're doing what you believe in. And the more you do what you believe in, I think the more good things will come. I love that, Sam, because I've been in situations in the past where you had to make that decision between taking a paycheck from something that might not be as ethical versus walking away because you know you're financially okay. And yeah. I think well, that's one of the best things you can do is by being financially independent, you get to actually make decisions that's more aligned with your values as opposed to the neediness of your current financial situation. Love that answer, Sam. 
Thank you so much for everybody tuning in. Buy This, Not That, How to Spend Your Way to Wealth and Freedom. Book just came out. We're going to have a link in the show notes so you can grab yourself a copy. It's a fantastic piece of uh, literature. You can actually learn about money mindset, how to put your money to work, maximizing your wealth, and understanding where to focus your main aspects in your life. Fantastic by Sam here and Financial Samurai. We'll make sure there's a link in the show notes so you can go and subscribe to the blog, check out the newsletter, and really be in touch with making that plan so your financial has a foundation and you get to grow on top of it. Sam, thank you so much again for your time. Hey, Jason. Thanks so much for having me. I am your host, Jason Mark Campbell, and this is the Selling with Love podcast.